Hello, this is Adi Wale from StressTherapist.net. Dealing with normal life can be hard work, especially when everything feels outside your control. There's just too many problems to analyze, let alone deal with. And that's why it's completely understandable that there's an increasing need to be able to cope better emotionally with the many setbacks that keep bombarding us. An increasing need to be able to stop going into meltdown whenever things go wrong and a need to be able to get a grip of the way we think so that we don't allow things to keep snowballing. But honestly though, learning to cope better emotionally is not easy. After all, you can't take someone and just magic all their real issues away, can you? I mean, it's really hard to just think differently when you're going through so much. It's hard to get your head out of this negative thought processes and think, yeah, yeah, it's all gonna happen. It's all gonna be great. If you can relate with everything I've said so far, I want to just take a moment to, to validate how you might be feeling right now and say, yes, it's true. Learning to cope emotionally is not easy. However, I'd like to go a step further to encourage you by saying, whilst learning the skill of coping is not easy, it's not impossible. And this was exactly the case with a gentleman I once met. I'll call him Terry. You see, when Terry found out that I was a psychotherapist, he began to sing the praises of an emotional skills group he recently attended. He used to be a skeptic before, he said, and seven years ago, he was given the opportunity to attend therapy, but he scoffed at it. Now he regretted that decision because he now felt that if only he knew half of what he now knows from attending that group, he would have been able to save himself from seven long years of heartache. Because within those seven long years, he had lost his marriage, lost custody of his kids, lost his job and amassed a huge amount of debt, and his family refused to have anything to do with him because he had a drinking problem. And all of this was as a result of not coping well emotionally. At the time, Terry was worried about his future prospects, angry that life was unfair, depressed because he, was, he felt he was failing everybody he loved, and often felt like ending it all. But now, Terry felt he'd come a long way with the help he received. Now, Terry was coping so well that he started working again, no longer feeling wound up by stuff, no longer feeling like he was going around in circles with no way out, no longer feeling, experiencing these intense feelings of overwhelm. And he started to get on better with his family members, mending bridges. In short, he started to find pleasure in life again. So you see, Terry's story really highlights that it's possible to learn the skill of coping. But now you might just be thinking, yeah right, but my situation is different. If that's the case, let me encourage you by saying this. The techniques that Terry learned can be learned by anybody as long as you are armed with the correct information and going in the right direction. But don't just take my word for it. Here's what one of my clients had to say about her own experience of learning the skill of coping emotionally. I would recommend this to anybody. I know when I met you at the school, there was tears in my eyes when I was talking to you. Yeah. Six, seven weeks on, I'm smiling. And this is not a fake smile. And it's not because you sit here for an hour and talk. It's because what I've learned within that hour and what I've put into practice and I learned how to deal with my situation and I learned that yes that stress come is how you handle it and if you don't know how to handle it it doesn't mean you can be praying for now to next year if you don't know how to handle that situation it won't make any difference mm -hmm. it won't do anything for you so I've learned how to handle my stress I've learned how to cope with it I've learned how to think different I've learned how to um, put practical situation into being. For instance, the different colors, emotion that has colors, right? 
I didn't know emotion has colors, stress has colors. And when you're going through certain emotion, you can actually say, oh, this is red. This is blue. This is green. Yeah, How do I read deal with this blue stress? What do I change in my situation? What do I reflect on to make sure it doesn't reach to a red stage where I get angry, frustrated, feel worthless? How do I deal with that? And I actually learn how to deal with that. And that take me from being green, blue, to a calmer place, to, you know, no stress at all. I started positive about me. I feel more positive about me. The situation still exists, but I'm still positive about me. So these are the kinds of results you can expect to achieve once you know what to do and how to do it. That said, in this video, I will be sharing with you the most common mistakes people tend to make in their efforts to cope through life difficulties. These were similar mistakes like Terry made, and in fact, these mistakes single-handedly got him entangled in so many of the problems we highlighted for seven long years. Then, I'll share with you a three-step process that will set you up in the right direction for learning effective skills for coping. And then at the end, I'll be telling you about how you can join me live in Wood Green, London, UK for a two week long series of workshops where we'll be learning advanced emotional resilience skills. But more on that later. For now, let's just get into the content of this video. Just in case you're thinking, who's this guy and why should I even be listening to him? My name is Adewale Ademiwa and I'm the founder and chief content writer for StressTherapist.net, a place where people come to learn evidence-based strategies that help them cope better emotionally through difficulties they find themselves in, especially those difficult situations they can't do anything about but have to live with. Call me crazy, but you see, I've got this passion which is to see that every single person on earth who's going through any emotional struggle learns how to break through and get their opportunity to start living and stop just existing. So why am I doing this? I used to struggle emotionally myself and whilst many people didn't know this, I had a social anxiety problem. This had a negative impact on the quality of my friendships almost ruined things academically for me and could have easily derailed the direction of my life. You see, I spent so many years just pushing things, trying hard, but just failing repeatedly. Then I went into the mental health field and as I started to help others, I began to gain some important insights to the nature of my own struggles. And one day I realized that there were certain essential and seemingly complex elements which are crucial for learning to cope. Concepts that anyone could apply. The only problem was that most people didn't even know these concepts exist. I applied this concept to myself and it worked. And as I began to share these concepts with other people, I began to see a pattern of people coping better, becoming more confident and becoming more resilient to the problems they were experiencing. So today in this video, I'm gonna be sharing one of these concepts with you. You see, most people live life oblivious to the fact that when it comes to coping, we all have a natural emotional and physical threshold. A threshold that when exceeded can easily send the strongest of humans into meltdown. You can tell if you've hit or on the verge of hitting this threshold if you regularly experience any of the following symptoms. Snapping, getting easily annoyed over small things, shouting when there's no real need to, losing patience quickly and often, getting frequently worried that you might just do something or say something awful that will have a lasting and damaging impact on people you care about. Or if you regularly pack too many things into your time, never really having enough time to finish any of those things, and you feel like your head might explode from the push and pull from all these things placing demands on you, or you just regularly feel like everything feels negative and you don't know how to pick yourself up. Or you often feel like you've become a different person, like you have no rational thinking, 
and, and the head feels so scrambled that you often lose control of what you're doing. Or you often find yourself feeling frustrated and aggressive with yourself. And some people will often feel weak emotionally, like they couldn't withstand any minor trauma. Or they feel like if anything happens, they'll just collapse and other people won't understand or want to help. Now, when it comes to coping emotionally, there are three distinctly different mindsets. And these mindsets have a massive impact on how well people can learn the skill of coping effectively. You see, the mindset with which you deal with your emotional threshold has a huge impact on your ability to cope. This is key because the effective management of your emotional threshold is what determines if you fold under life's pressure or you would bounce back from your struggles with more confidence and a healthy sense of self-worth. So now, I'll name these three mindsets and I'll describe each one giving real-life examples so you don't get caught out by them. The three mindsets are Mindset 1 The oblivious but coping mindset Mindset 2 The oblivious but not coping mindset and Mindset 3, the aware but not coping mindset. So, what do they all mean? Mindset number one, the oblivious but coping mindset. Who's impacted by this mindset? The oblivious but coping mindset is experienced by people who are currently coping but completely oblivious to the fact that a real-life emotional threshold exists. So what does this mindset do? It tricks people into thinking that they're somehow above emotional difficulties, making them consider themselves to be strong people emotionally, and they may not even be consciously aware that they're thinking this way. But the biggest problem with this mindset is that since people don't know that a real emotional threshold exists, their way of managing emotional issues turns them into emotional accidents waiting to happen. It's almost like they're walking in the middle of the motorway, blindfolded, unaware the cars are flying at them at 100 miles an hour. And this is exactly what happened to Jim. You see, Jim was in a situation where he had a job he could enjoy. He could afford going for holidays three times a year. He worked with a team of supportive people, so there was a good balance of objective criticism and praise. So for over 15 years, life was exactly the way he wanted it. Then something happened. The company he worked for folded financially and this left Jim redundant. Then for a long, long time, he couldn't find a job that gave him the same sort of satisfaction. And then in the jobs he got, he often found himself heavily criticized, undermined and bullied. Eventually, Jim lost confidence in himself. Stuck in a cycle of self-criticism and emotional meltdowns, this left him thinking, this can't be happening to me. I'm strong. I can cope. I've always coped with pressure. What's so different this time? I used to be confident and able to cope with any sorts of pressure. Now I feel like I've lost the old me. And I'm afraid I'll never be able to get that back again. Now, this brings me to a very important point. Jim's problems wasn't because he had lost his old confident self. In fact, his old confident self was still there, buried beneath all the pressure and pain he was going through. Jim's problem was because he was fooled by the oblivious but coping mindset to think he had naturally inbuilt coping skills. So he had unintentionally neglected to put in the time to learn necessary coping skills that would have made him truly robust to face unexpected life events. Then I met with Jim in therapy and taught him the necessary skills he needed. The result was that he was able to bounce back to coping better emotionally and became even more confident than he was before. How did we achieve this? I'll be touching on that in a moment, but for now let's go to the next mindset. Mindset number two. The oblivious but not coping mindset. Who is impacted by this mindset? The oblivious but not coping mindset is experienced by people who are aware that they are not coping, 
but who still have no idea that an emotional threshold exists. They are aware that they feel vulnerable. They can recognize that they often feel frustrated, fatigued, and exhausted with life's issues, but they don't really know what's going on. You see, they don't really realize that their current lifestyle is frequently making them crash into their emotional threshold. So what does this mindset do? The oblivious but not coping mindset tricks people into constantly spending a high percentage of their time focusing on their life problems. And as a result, they end up living their lives in a constant battle to solve those problems. Unfortunately, they use means and methods that end up creating more pressure for them. And then they end up pushing themselves even harder to do things, even though their body is screaming, please take a break. The biggest problem with the oblivious but not coping mindset though, is that it tends to make people sink into a place where they increasingly feel vulnerable, powerless, and helpless to problems that are not within their control eventually making them feel trapped and stuck. And that's exactly what happened to Eunice. You see, Eunice had a husband who left her for another woman with two under 10 year old kids. And as is often the case, she was adamant that she would show her ex that she could survive without him. So she kept on pushing herself really hard, going through everything without getting any help from anybody. She knew she was tired, but what else was she supposed to do? She just had to keep on going. Eventually, she started having panic attacks, snapping at her kids and feeling guilty about it, waking up in the morning, feeling low and demotivated, feeling frustrated with herself because her mind knew what it wanted to do, but no matter how hard she tried, her body just refused to do it. When Eunice came to me for therapy, she described her struggles like this. I've got too many problems, too confusing. I cannot begin to describe or analyze them. I'm living in great fear because my independence is being affected by my financial situation. This affects my health, which then swings back to affect my finances since I can't cope with the amount of work I need to do to bring in enough money. You know, the first thing you ask is, how did you end up in this place? You've worked so hard. It's like everything you feared is now there, is now happening. What do you do? You can't move and you can't see tomorrow. You just get up and it's like, well, this is it. Here I am. I can't do nothing. You end up feeling like there's no way out. And even though some people will say to me, don't worry, it's going to get better. I ask how and when. Is it really? I'll be honest, I felt very bad for Eunice. What she had to go through was really unfair. She was a hard worker. Why did she have to suffer so much after working so hard and then still have an emotional meltdown on top of it all? This brings me to my next crucial point. The biggest problem for Eunice was that she was tricked into believing that the only way she could deal with her life difficulties was to push herself really hard, doing something tangible to solve the problems she had. She didn't realize she had to work to fortify and sustain herself emotionally as well. This would have stopped her from crashing into her threshold, helping her remain energized, clear-minded, and motivated to deal with her real life issues. So I met with Eunice for three months in therapy and helped her to learn the coping skills she needed. After this, she reported she was in a much calmer place. Her life difficulties were still present, but she was managing things better, making fewer wrong choices. Now she was able to achieve her day-to-day -day goals without feeling exhausted and drained like she used to. I'll be giving you insights into how Eunice managed to achieve this in a minute. For now, let's go to the next mindset. Mindset number three, the aware but not coping mindset. Who's impacted by this mindset? The aware but not coping mindset is experienced by people who are aware that they are not coping. They've also become aware that an emotional threshold exists. They've become convinced of its existence either because of their repeated failed attempts to break through their emotional struggles 
or because of new understanding they've gained from attending therapy. However, because a huge aspect of the emotional threshold remains a mystery, they just don't know what to do about it. So what does this mindset do? Because of this mindset, people are able to accommodate the fact that emotional difficulties are a normal human problem. However, in spite of this acceptance, this mindset still manages to make people blame themselves for not being able to break out of their emotional problems. If you can relate with this, you might regularly find yourself thinking, I know what I should be doing, but I can't find the motivation to maintain it. Or you feel like you've been trying, maybe you haven't been trying new techniques, you're just trying only the ones you know and they're not getting you anywhere. And this all begins to make you feel victimized like, it's all against me. Why is everything so hard for me? Why not him or her? It makes me feel like something must be wrong with me and I just can't figure it out. Now, the biggest problem with this mindset is that it tricks people into an attitude that holds them back from a sustained recovery from emotional difficulties. It forces people into a place of despondency. And here's how one of my clients described their struggle with the aware but not coping mindset. I feel like I'm trying, 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 but not getting anywhere. Nothing is working and I'm feeling more and more down about myself as I can see other people coping. I'm really trying to stop, think, calm myself down and be positive. Sometimes I might get control over it, but most times, no matter how hard I try, in that moment, at the time when it's happening, nothing is stopping it, nothing is making it feel any better. I've come to realize that my emotional problems are real. There's nothing I can do about it. I've just got to live with it. What's the point of trying to beat it? I've tried everything and nothing has worked. If you can relate, I know going through all this can make you feel very much alone. But I'd like to encourage you by saying, you are not alone. If you were truly alone, how would I be able to describe this struggle to you so clearly? I would also like to reinforce this point. If you feel like you've been falling prey to any of the three mindsets we've discussed so far, and you've gotten to the point of struggling for years with difficult emotions, not being able to break through them. If this is your experience, please take note of this important point. It's not your fault. The reason you're struggling to break through isn't because there's something wrong with you and it isn't because you haven't tried hard enough. In fact, in my experience, most people are trying bleedingly hard. Sadly, however, a lot of people are trying really hard but going in the wrong direction. And no matter how hard you try, there is no way going in the wrong direction will get you to the right place. But if we just keep on going in the wrong direction, our lives will eventually become riddled with repeated painful experiences because one way or another, we end up thinking that all we can do to cope better emotionally is to just keep on going. And the end result will be that we'll never get the opportunity to find more effective ways of coping through the difficulties we encounter. And in my over 20 years of working in the mental health field, I've come to realize that in order to cope better emotionally with the difficulties we experience in life, a systematic approach is essential for dealing with the act of coping itself. But how do you practically put that into action? I'll get into that in a second. Sadly, there's yet another common misconception to this subject of coping, which I feel duty bound to share with you. You see, it's almost as if society is kind of expecting the ability to cope properly to be inbred in us naturally. And everyone buys into this misconception too. No one questions it. Like you're just expected to see how people are dealing with things and you maybe take something from here and another thing from there, but there's no real answer to it. This doesn't work because how one person copes is not going to work for everybody. It's hit and miss, trial and error. No formula for what to do in that situation. And truth be told, if we were to sit down and talk about it, I don't think anyone got taught 
how to cope with things effectively. I mean, your parents don't sit you down, go through your life and teach you. Most people are just told to just get on with it. So, what am I really saying here? We need to start seeing the issue of coping as a skill. Just as much as you learn the skill of driving, just as much as you learn the skill of table manners, for example, coping is a skill with rules to be followed. Coping is a skill with practical steps and we need to make out time to learn that skill so that we don't keep crashing into our emotional threshold. Now that I've established the point that it's important to not just do nothing, as things will only get worse if you do so, you're probably now thinking, so what do I do? Most health systems have a pretty long waiting list for psychological therapies. Is there something I can start doing right now to make some progress in my situation? Okay, I've got two options for you. You can either take the DIY option where I show you how to find and implement the most effective strategies that work best for you. Or you can come and join me in Wood Green, UK, London for our Taking Back Control series of workshops. This is a free eight part series where I guide you step by step through the whole process of learning how to cope better emotionally, thereby removing any tedious research processes or guesswork you need to do. Okay, first, I'll describe the DIY process for you. Then I'll give a brief description of the free emotional skills building series and give you instructions on how to get to us. The strategies and techniques we'll be covering in this free series are the same ones that help Jim and Eunice break through their own emotional struggles. So if you'd like to be guided through these techniques, join us and test the strategies out for yourself. Moving on to the DIY process, I call this three-step DIY technique the WHR method. I've prepared a special worksheet for you so you can work through this process as I'm describing it. If you're watching this video on Facebook or on YouTube, you'll find a link in the description of this video. Just click on that link and it will take you to a page where you can request for your free worksheet. Here we go. The WHR method for finding and implementing more effective ways of coping better emotionally. A quick disclaimer. Please note, I'm not in any way suggesting that this is a 100% foolproof method for finding the best coping strategy. Whilst the strategy has worked for many people, you can only get from it what you put into it. In addition, you need to be certain that any strategy you try has a solid scientific base. Otherwise, you can create more problems for yourself. Step one, be clear about the problems you want resolved and the outcomes you would love to achieve. You need to answer these questions. What's the biggest problem you're struggling with right now and what outcome are you after? The first step to finding the right solutions to any problem is to be clear and concise on what the problem actually is. You see, it's quite common to have more than one problem area all modeled up into one massive big problem. Focusing on the biggest problem helps us to start organizing our thinking so that we don't unintentionally bombard ourselves with too much to do at a go. The second part of step one is about the outcomes. You see, although many people have some idea of the problems they want to solve, they haven't really put much thought into the outcomes they want to see. So we need to be very clear about the outcomes we want to achieve because not doing this is like throwing darts on a dartboard blindfolded and all our efforts will be hit and miss. An example of the biggest problem could be something like, I'm struggling with worrying too much all the time. And maybe one outcome I'd like to achieve is, I want to be able to change the way I think. Did you see what I did there? The description of the problem and the outcome I want to achieve are both very clear and concise. And it also has an emotional element in there. That's because we're trying to address those issues that are related to emotional difficulties. So when you're trying to define your big problem, remember to connect it to emotions you find yourself experiencing a lot. Now we are moving on to step two of our technique. In this step, you want to determine how you're currently coping or dealing with this biggest problem. 
You're trying to decipher why you think your attempts are not helping. So you answer the following questions. A. How am I currently coping with this problem? And what are the possible reasons why my current coping methods aren't working? Now, when asked this specific question, many people answer, I've got no coping strategies because I'm simply not coping. So to answer this question, you simply pick a recent situation where the problem you want to address surfaced. What did you do in response? How did you react? This will usually give you an idea of how you're trying to manage the problem. Now, whilst this might seem like a guessing exercise for many, starting to think this way gives you a better chance of aiming in the right direction. Remember what I said earlier? That many people are trying bleedingly hard but going in the wrong direction. Following the suggestion in this step will help you avoid that trap. In the second part of step two, we want to call out what hasn't worked. We want to make this very tangible. So write this down and place it where you can regularly see it. This gives you a better chance for not falling for the same strategies over and over again. This is another important trap we want to avoid. Some examples for step two. An example of what I'm currently doing could be trying to be hard on myself, telling myself, don't be so stupid, this is not worth worrying about, and try to keep busy, also tried distracting myself. Examples of why this hasn't worked could be something like, I've always tried to prepare for every eventuality because I can't cope with anything that's unexpected. So I find it difficult to let go of worrying. Now moving on to step three. In step three, we do research to find different ways of coping that matches with the outcomes we are looking for. Then we test out our findings. This brings me to a crucially important point. You see, when looking for better ways of coping, most people just skip step one and step two of this process and start right at the research phase. This is a big, big mistake and it tends to lead to four very big problems. When you haven't done the work to be clear and concise on the big problem you want to address and the outcomes you hope to achieve, following the steps I described earlier, you run the risk of doing something I refer to as a problem-based search. What does this mean? With a problem-based search, people do something like typing into Google the word anxiety. And then Google being the intelligent bot that it is, brings out all these results around anxiety. You'll then notice the results are around definitions of anxiety or experiences, bad experiences people have had with anxiety or the kind of problems you can experience with anxiety. If you're lucky, you get a few solutions people have tried, but it's often too specific for you to find it useful. The second problem that this causes is that you may end up with search results that lead you to more distress. This has the potential of leaving you more worried, helpless and hopeless than you were before you started out. The third problem, if you skip step one of this process particularly, you find that the search results you keep finding are not specific enough to your personal situation. And this also can generate feelings of overwhelm, feelings of helplessness, making you feel there's no solutions to your problems. And then problem four, if you skip step two of this process, it means you won't be armed with an extensive knowledge of the things you've tried that didn't work. The end result is that you're left having to sift through and test out many more suggested solutions than is necessary and this just ends up being a waste of your time. So take your time, go through step one and two of this method carefully and once you've completed that, continue with step three. So for step three, we do a how to search in Google using a list of the preferred outcomes you generated in step two. This helps to avoid most problem based results as I described earlier. Then work through the suggested solutions you find, removing those you've tried before. So a good example of a how to Google search is this, how to change the way I think. Okay, let's test this out. Go to Google, and type in the word anxiety. Notice the types of results you get. And then delete that 
and type in how to change the way I think, you'll suddenly see a list of practical suggestions that you can try out. As a more advanced form of this step, you can also do a how-to search in Amazon Books using your list of preferred outcomes. And here's a very good way to qualify books or videos you'd like to consider. Criteria 1. Look for books or videos that have at least 50 glowing comments. The glowing comments must contain practical examples of how the book led people to achieve outcomes that are similar to the ones you are aiming for. If there are many people saying similar positive and relevant things about the book, there's a high chance it's got good advice on how to reach the outcomes you want. Criteria 2. Are the methods and strategies suggested by the book based on research or on scientific evidence? Or is it just based on fluff science? So, check to see if the author gives any research information to back up what they're suggesting. Criteria 3. Is the book or video created in a friendly language or is it just full of scientific jargon? Emotional difficulties are complicated enough themselves. So it's best to get something that's easy to follow and enjoyable to read or listen to. And then finally, criteria four. Does the book or video have practical step-by-step -step advice to offer or is it just full of narratives? So once you've gone through these criteria and you've selected your candidate, test out the new ways of coping suggested by the author and see if it works. Now, it's good to give any strategies you're trying some time to take effect. Don't fall for the attitude that thinks if it doesn't work first time, then it's no use. Give it some time. I would usually give any strategy at least 30 days of trial before giving up on it. And this brings me to the end of the WHR method. Granted, it does take some time and effort to find the right solutions you are after. But if you are doing this all on your own, I believe taking the time out to be precise on the solutions you find will save you many more years of heartache and pain. Now, if you'd rather not go through all this research process by yourself, and you'd love to be guided step by step through the process of learning to cope better emotionally, then come and join us for our Emotional Resilience series. Here's the brief description I promised earlier. The series is on how to cope and function effectively in problematic situations. In module one, we look at how to avoid or overcome emotional traps that keep people stuck in painful or unrewarding life experiences. In this module, I cover the four most common traps that stops people from coping and I introduce you to a concept I call the emotional weakness myth that keeps stress-related problems alive and damaging in people's lives. In module two, we look at how to break free from the repeating problematic patterns that stop you from functioning effectively in pressured life, work and relationship situations. You learn how to ensure that the emotional weakness myth doesn't keep you locked in subconscious stress cycles. Then I'll introduce you to something I call the NSDR technique. The NSDR technique will demystify the problem of coping for you. If you're feeling bombarded by multiple difficult life events, this series will show you that there are ways to manage those difficult issues so that they don't overwhelm you. You will get real life examples about people having problems and issues that you will be able to relate to. This will help take out the guesswork from the equation so that you don't keep making wrong choices that come back to bite you. So in module three, we'll be looking at practical steps to help you stop the buildup of feeling overwhelmed when multiple things go wrong at once. As one of my former clients said, I could see a difference in just one session. These modules are not like other forms of therapy that cover loads of stuff, but don't get you to where you want to be emotionally. We'll be helping you make important connections so you can understand where you are, where you want to go, how to get there, and how to react when certain things cause you to feel overwhelmed. In module 4, we'll be uncovering your hidden emotional blocks to coping better 
in life relationships and employment. If you've ever found yourself in a place where you ask yourself, what's wrong with me? Why am I in this horrible emotional place? This module will help you recognize the feelings you go through and give you a clear idea of the exact steps to take to deal with it. Module 5 helps to uncover the behavioral habits that you've become reliant on, especially those ones that keep you trapped in vulnerable places. And in Module 6, we begin to learn better techniques for gaining control over emotions that sabotage effective coping and decision making in our lives. Here's how one of my former clients described what she gained from this module. She said, I can see myself and the things I'm struggling with explained and very well related to with each content of the course. I find myself dealing with stressful situations better and the sessions have gotten me out of a distressing place. So you see, you become more conversant with the subconscious patterns that breathe stress into your personal situation and you begin to have a clear perspective on what you can do to break out of these patterns. Module 7. This is one of my best modules. This is where we develop your personal practical system for coping with and improving difficult situations in your life. Why have we added this module? You see, in my 20 years of working in the mental health field, I've seen this pattern where people are just lumped into groups of medical problems. You see, I prefer to deal with each person like an individual. Why? Because we all have very, very different personalities, very different backgrounds. As a result, the emotional things we will struggle with will naturally have some nuances. So I find it much more helpful to treat people differently. Finally, in module eight, we explore a concept I call the edge. This is really about the edge of your emotional threshold. You see, even when people have become aware that their way of doing things can't be sustained by their mind and bodies, they still run the risk of either not pushing things far enough or overdoing things. And this can still lead to many problems. So in this final module, we show you exactly how to avoid that trap. This is the full emotional resilience skills building system we'll be covering over the two week period starting from this Saturday, the 17th of October, 2015. And I'm really looking forward to seeing you there. The folks from the Wood Green Community SDA Church have decided to host the Stress Therapist team. And the best part, they've kindly decided to pay for the whole program so that it's 100% free for you to attend. If you had to pay for this whole series yourself, it would have set you back 792 pounds so this is a very valuable program that has been put together just for you and it's totally free so how do you get to the venue here's the address number 15 north court avenue london and the postcode n227 db i'll repeat the address again 15 north court avenue london postcode n22 7db i have also included the address in the description of this video plus if you click the link in the video it will take you to a page that describes the contents of each module clearly so that you know exactly what you're getting this brings us to the end but before you go i'd love to hear from you so please scroll down leave a comment let me know what you think about the obstacles traps the suggestions and the tips that I've shared in this video. I'm going to be reading through these comments regularly and I'll be answering questions you have. So please scroll down, leave a comment and I'll see you this coming Saturday.